Here's something interesting. While speaking, this lizard is still there with me. He's there. I, I don't know where the companion went, but he's still there. Good chap. Look at him down there. Still listening to the word. I hope you stick with me too. You gotta hear the word, man. God bless, right? <laughs> I'm trying to get, I don't get the other video ready. Look at the other one. I'm trying to get it ready in the iMovie. I'm trying to upload and put it together. <laughs> God bless it. Now, yo, the sound effect. This is going to be now. We're going to go by the grace of God. God with us, the desire of ages by Ellen G. White. Let me see each other preface. He says, dear friend, the publisher of this and other happiness books listed, to the, listed on the inside back cover have found Christ to be a personal friend. We trust that these books will bring you closer to God, giving you happiness, love, and understanding. I hope this sound comes out good. This was done back in 1990 by Better Living Publications, a trademark of ASI Missions. This was a long time ago I had this book. Let me see. What does, what does the back say? I think I read it a while ago. In the beginning, God was revealed in all the works of creation. It was Christ that spread the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. It was his and it's his hand that hung the worlds in space and fashioned the flowers of the field. I'm out of space in this one. I'm out of space, so I'm ah, uh, so I gotta I gotta do it over in pieces. Okay, so I gotta I gotta send it up as is. Okay, may I break it up in pieces and do it that way? Okay, fine. Okay, I need to I need to read some other stuff. Okay, it was Christ that spread the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. It was his hand that hung the worlds in space and fashioned the flowers of the field. His strength set it fast the mountains. The sea is his, and he made it. Psalm 65, 6, 95, 5. It was, sorry, it was he that filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. And upon all things in earth and air and sky, he wrote the message of the Father's love. You will find this book to be a work of inspiration. It is the life story of the greatest spiritual leader of the world, sorry, the world has ever known, Jesus Christ. This book does not merely set down a series of remote events. It presents the meaning of them so vividly that we feel ourselves there. And we are made to understand, possibly for the first time, the true underlying significance of his ideas and their bearing on our own lives, here and now. The Desire of Ages has already proven a source of inspiration and enlightenment to millions of readers all over the world. And with good reason, for it deals with a universal yearning, the living of a life to its fullest, and a faith born in meaningful values. ISBN number, in case you want to get this book here. ISBN 0-8163-1004-1. Feel free to take a look. By Ellen G. White. Ellen Gould White. And I'll work in the movie after. So let's read some parts. Let me see. It's two pages back and forth. It's so different. But let's see what you can do. If you have time with me, bear with me today. Maybe I'll do it in different pieces to make it small and break it up into pieces. Maybe I'll do it to make it easier to upload. The first one, God with us. These are The second one's going to be about... Um, I think it's about the rest come rest a while or about unless they get signs and signs and signs and signs and sights and sounds. Let's see. Not the, not the movie play, but this one. So God with us. Here we go. Desire of Ages first. I'm sorry. Desire of Ages, yes. First part. Page one. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the, the, light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us, Emmanuel, right? Therefore, it was prophesied of him. His name shall be called Emmanuel. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angel. He was the word of God, God's thought made audible. In his prayer and for his disciples, he says, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. But not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is a lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. Now, I read this to say that there's an actual version of Ellen G. White, um, E. G. White receipts on the App Store. I think it's the E. G. White writers one and two. But I don't have I don't have an audible version to read it to me. So last time I'm gonna read this one to you. Forgive me if I've been reading it fast and stuff. But you could see the audible digital version online if you can get the actually hardcover, the soft cover books. Okay. So bear with me. What I would rather do is I rather read it from how she reads it herself, and maybe add little bits here and there that I see what what applies to us today. 
but you hear me in a lot of things. So I don't think you need to hear me that much other things unless God puts it in my heart, okay? So I'm not just speaking for speaking sake. I speak as God puts it in my heart, by his mercies. Let me see. Right? It says here, both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their signs and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrifice and love. And if I, read, if I did this one before, a couple and another, another reading, it's okay. We're going to do another one again. It can't get enough. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of, this, of, this, of self renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. And that in the meek and lowly one is manifest the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. In the beginning, God was revealed in all the works of creation. It was Christ that spread the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. It was his hand that hung the worlds in space and fashioned the, fall, the flowers of the field. His strength set it fast to found the mountains. The sea is his, and he made it. Psalm 65, 6, and 95, 5. It was he that filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. And upon all things in earth and in sky and air, he wrote the message of the Father's love. Now sin has marred God's perfect work, yet that handwriting remains. Even now all created things declare the glory of His excellence. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest, no lowly blade of grass, but has its, mi its ministry. It's true. You look at the leaf and you see the details in the grass. Look at the details of the grass and stuff here and the tree and the leaves and stuff. They all tell a story. Beauty, beauty, beauty. And this is one of, of billions beauty everywhere god bless it every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live and man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf everything in a big cycle the flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty in blessings to the world the sun sheds its light to gladden to gladden a thousand worlds the ocean you know what she just said the sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds are we alone just saying a thousand worlds ellen g white the lesser light points to the greater light her words are true because her words have come true according to what god prophesied the ocean itself the source of all springs and fountains the ocean itself the source of all springs and fountains receives the streams from every land but takes to give Sounds interesting. The mist ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth. You know the water cycle? That it may bring forth and bud. The angels of glory find their joy in giving. Giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. That's what angels do. Not to go sleep around the humans. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle, and, by gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. That's what angels are for, ministering spirits. Not to see them come and ransack and destroy earth and be left for them to sleep with humans. No, they're here to help humanity to, to make it. Where they're here, they want their root for us. Come on, come on, make it. But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God, this is page two of um, Desire of Ages, and the one about God with us. But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. I do nothing of myself, Christ said. The living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. John chapter 8, verse 28, 6 and 57, and 8, verse 50, and 7, verse 18. In these words is set forth the great principle which is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give, excuse me. <coughs> I'm choking too, there's a lot of pollen flying around. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry, for all created beings, yeah, all of us to see. Through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son, at capital S-O-N, it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the greatest source of all life. Why are we reading this? Because we keep searching for what God already has placed there. The desire of ages is Jesus Christ. And thus through Christ, <coughs> yeah, and, it's okay. and thus through Christ, 
The circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver and law of life. In heaven itself, the law was broken. Sin originated in self-seeking. Lucifer, the covering cherub, now called Satan, desired to be, when he fell, he became Satan and the devil, the great deceiver, desired to be the, decided to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings, to draw them away from their creator, and to win their homage to himself. Therefore, he misrepresented God, attributing to him, God, the desire of self-exaltation. That's what Satan was doing, trying to denounce God's name. With his own selfish character, his own evil characteristics, Satan sought to invest the loving, the loving creator. Invest the living creator. He tried to say that God is evil, like the, the Gnostic, agnostic gospels or G-N-O-S-T-I-C gospels, to try to make evil seem good and good seem evil. Thus he deceived the angels. Thus he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness. Because God is a God of justice and terrible majesty, Satan caused them to look upon him, God, look upon God as severe and unforgiving. Is that what we see in our lives today? No. God is the opposite of what Satan said. Thus, Satan drew men to join him in rebellion against God. And the night of woe settled down upon us, the world. And he was banished to stay on earth. The earth was dark through misapprehension of God. That the gloomy shadows might be lightened. That the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. So when people say, I try to force you to worship God and to force you to follow what the world is telling you and to force you with mandates and force you to do it or else with threats of death and everything, destruction, that tells you what spirit they are of. Not every spirit is the capital spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. There are many spirits that are evil in the earth, which are called fallen angels. Angels are ministering spirits to us. So those spirits are, are really are fallen angels. But the real spirit, capital spirit of God, is the Holy Spirit, which is God. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. But not the spirits, lower spirits, or demigod of the earth. Okay? He says here. But tell me, let me see. Right? Yeah. The, so the angels do their part, right? Heaven. Where am I on earth? Am I in heaven? Yeah. I'm going to go back here. I'll, I'll go back to this passage. The angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men, right? They bring to this dark world light for the courts above. By gentle, patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. Right? Let's go back to this side now. Let me make sure I don't miss it. I'm all over here, right? About force. Right? I lost my track here, but let's say that's, that's just important too. So anything of force is, and compulsion, not of God. God does it with lovingly wounds. He gives you the freedom of choice, exercise that willpower to choose. He desires only the service of love, God. And love cannot be commanded. Love cannot be won by force or authority. So when you see them, see anyone, any group exercising that, any even religious, turn from them. Okay? Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to know and to love Him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Okay? God and Satan are not equal. And Satan is not the exact opposite. Like if he's equal like a yin-yang of power. Satan is a fallen created being. But he had the same freedom of choice that we have. So just as how he can choose to do wrong and to do right, we can do the same. So he chose to do wrong and refused to change. We can be just as stiff-necked and stubborn and adamant and deserving of death. That's what Satan will get. So you got to take the cho two choices here. One, God and God alone or the other. But they're not equal. Only by love is love awakened. Okay? God's character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Being means Jesus Christ. Only he, Jesus, he's a capital he, who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the sun of righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. That's Jesus. The plan of our redemption was not an afterthought. A plan formulated, like a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. Like he's like, oh, oh yes, you know, Jesus, yeah, we got it, we, we messed up, something happened, we gotta go fix it. No, 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 this was all planned before. Satan was mad because he was left out of those, 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 those councils. I tell you some people, if I don't know, if I'm not aware of it, I'm not gonna help anything. I'm gonna sabotage it because they're not a part. Jealousy and envy, shame, shame, shame. No, leave, it's okay. I, I keep it, I keep the word there, this is just the bigger light. 
The plan of our redemption was not in afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which had been kept in silence to the times eternal. Romans 16, 16 verse 25, it tells you what happened. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man. So nothing was like, oh, he caught you by surprise. No, they knew. And of the fall of man to the deceptive power of the apostate. God knew man might fall from Satan. Well, why are you permitted it then? Because that gift of life, the gift of choice, the gift of freedom to choose, we have to see how powerful that gift can be. For weal and for woe, for good and for bad. If not, how would we know the difference? He's given us time to see and to learn and to apply and to, and to, and to choose. So, which do we want? To be robots? Or do we want to be living entities of God? Right? So, both him and God knew. Right? From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist. Understand? He didn't say sin should exist. Right? But he foresaw its existence. So nothing by surprise to God. And he made provision, mean a way to get out of it, to meet the terrible emergency. He knew that sin would destroy everything. But he made provision. He made a plan. Just in case, as God said, plan ahead. Before you build a house, count the cost, plan ahead. Make plans. Make a, make a blueprint. Make it happen. Before the table is corrected, wow, how, how should I plan this? How should I design and the edges and trim and da-da-da-da-da? Okay? God is not a God of chaos and noise and bedlam. He's a God of order. He foresaw the existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was His love, God's love for the world, that He, gover that he covenanted to give His law His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life in John 3.16. But people keep saying, no, no, it's really it's Lucifer. Because of Lucifer's fall, the light bear, he now brought light and knowledge to us. Oh, oh, that's sophistry and deception. Lucifer didn't bring us no light and light and wisdom. He brought us death. He brought us to see what happens when we choose to do evil. He brought us death, okay? God brought us life. And to choose to resist it, live life, resist temptation is what gives us life. So the devil brought us death and damnation, not the opposite, okay? Lucifer had said, I will exalt, on page, this is three, I will exalt, everything is like compressing, this would be like normally one big page, but it's compressed two, two pages into one. Lucifer had said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high. This is Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. I like how Ellen G. White, she interper, intersperses the verses with the, with the scriptures to support what she's talking about. She had a, lot of, had a lot of visions of God's ministry and everything that happened in the Bible and Old and New Testament. She wrote the books, she wrote the, the, the Prophets and Kings, Patriots and Prophets, Desire of Ages, you know, The Great Controversy, all those books they have to give on so many others. But you don't hear a name talked about. Ellen Goldwater, Ellen G. White. Very nice. And she, she builds up everything with supporting evidences of it. And even her estate, they still build it up with supporting evidences. So it, pay, it, it would be in our best interest to please study her work and writings. In tandem, she have the book here. This is like the big light, less light. Tell me the story, and I'll give you little details and be hit me on the side next to it. That's what I'm saying. Both hand, I have a hand in each. But the race of God. Right? You see, Satan said, Satan said, I'll be like the most high in Isaiah 14, 13, and, and 14. But Christ, being in the form of God, counted it not a thing to be grasped, to be an equality, to be on an equality with God. Because he is God. But emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. Philippians verses 2 and 6 and 7. This was a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus might have remained at the Father's side. He might have restrained, sorry, retained the glory of heaven and the homage of the angels. But he chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands and to step down from the throne of the universe that he might bring life to the benighted. Nice word, benighted. And life to the perishing. Isn't that nice? Jesus chose to step down from the throne of the universe that he might bring life to the benighted. Is it benighted or benighted? Benighted. B-E-N-I-G-H-T-E-D. It's a nice word. I learned you write some good words. For a woman who supposedly had only a third grade education. He has some very powerful words. And life to the perishing. I'm impressed. I don't look down on anybody, okay? I'm not reading, you know? Nearly, two, my leg is sleeping. Sorry. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice of mysterious import was heard in heaven. From the throne of God, lo, I come. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. But a body hast thou prepared me, he said, right? Lo, I come. 
in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O God Hebrews right chapter 10 verses 5 to 7 that's God in these words is announced the fulfillment of the purpose that had been hidden from eternal ages Christ was about to visit our world right the Messiah and lo and lo to become incarnate okay not just to Mary and you know and the conception but he's here he's this was planned before Mary so and she's not the mother of God in that respect in that she she's a vessel like us who by his by her humility and by his mercies became a vessel and said Lord behold thy handmaid as we should be Lord behold thy servant as Isaiah and every other prophet and obeyed God was our, our to God and energy white was and do a good a godly work right he says here and he appeared let me see so he says a body a body has thou prepared me and that he appeared and he had he appeared in the glory that was his, his right his was his with the father before the world was we could not have endured the light of the prophet's presence we would, we would all be struck dead it's too bright that we might behold it and not be destroyed the manifestation of his glory was shrouded his Jesus' divinity was veiled with humanity the invisible glory in the visible human form nice right very nice I like that. I like that. It's too powerful to be seen. It makes sense. You look like looking at a car in high beams and headlights or LED lights. It's, ah, it's too bright. Now imagine seeing God. It's unapproachable brightness and beauty. That's when, when Moses saw Jesus and when he went up to the mountain, you know, when he, when he had to behold the glory of God, his face was lightened. He had to put a veil over his face. They could, the people couldn't even see. They said, Moses, your face is glowing. Wow. I saw it in a video. They made a video of it. In, I think it was called The Kids' Ten Commandments where he made like a cartoon version of it. Just to behold, just to be in the presence of God, it changed you. And I said, isn't that interesting? Like, like going into, like, here's something, like going into a tannin booth. Like, you know, our teeth whitening. By some lights, we go to some lights we use on our teeth, like lightning, like, like you know, those things. We can make our teeth lighter and brighter by UV light. By going into some booths of heat and lamps and other stuff, we can make ourselves get tanned. And I guess maybe the other. Some things can make you whiter and brighter. I wanted to be in the presence of light, always bright. Light can have an effect on us. Blue light and light can affect how much energy we have and stuff like that too. Like I see yellow, amber lights. I feel sleepy and dull. I'm like, uh. But I see bright light. I'm like, yes, I want bright. I like bright lights. But not every time. When I'm even at night, like, that's why we have night lights. When you get up at nighttime, it's like, uh, uh. And it also messes with us with, messes with our circadian rhythm and the flow and our sleep. So it's good to have light sometimes, but not all the time is not that. But this light of God, to, to, everything, is a time, to everything is a time and purpose. Sometimes we need to see the brightness of God. Like when he's going to come back with, his, with the brightness of his glory to strike down the devil and all the angels, everybody that's wicked with him, strike them down and the evil in the world. That light we want. Right? But to, but to, but to have a light, how his bright is to be among us every day. The children of Israel couldn't even endure the brightness of Moses' face. Moses, your face. So bright. Not because he's ugly, but light was so beautiful. It's like, whoa. And the sin of, the sin of, the sin of, the, 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 the light, it's kind of interesting. That's, that light, that God shows us it's like it's such a way that it shows us our sin it shows us how bad we are it's like, a, it's like an instant mirror whoa I see how really wicked and vile I am compared to this God it's just too much we see it in anime and some of the show when you show that bright light of light of energy coming towards you it's so much it's so bright but God wants us to see remember even Moses was like Lord I want to see your glory show me your glory and God said I cannot show you my glory and, and you will live I can show you my backward parts so when he, he said, I'll hide you into a cleft of the rock. And as I pass by, I'll cover you. And I'll show you. And when he see God passing by, as God covered him, he saw his back parts. And he's like, whoa. And he heard the voices. Holy, holy, the train of God has fallen him. Could you imagine what God is really like? Could you imagine his throne? He cannot fit into this earth. Earth fits into his hand. Oh, it's a speck in his hand. Could you imagine how big God is? Why is he a man? Why is he not a woman? Oh, does he have a wife? Is it this? All these questions we have, we will get the answer one day. But until then, as I said in the first video, we don't have to have all the answers now. Let it work in our mind to then search the scriptures and learn and see. What's the context? What does it mean? Why is the Bible, Bible written in such a patriarchal sense? There's a reason why God says men and women are different. What does it mean? Just because you don't know the answer now, we know the answer doesn't mean we have to condemn one or the other. We don't put a man of a woman, a woman of a man. But God said, there's a woman, he said, a woman should not have usurped the authority over a man. God made Adam first and then the woman after. It doesn't mean women are not important. They're just as significant. But why does somebody say they need to be 
on equality in terms of being a pastor and priest in God's, in God's word. If God said women should not be priests in God's word. It's not because God is wrong. If we don't know the answer, why are we going to speculate and judge and say, because the effort God says. Here a little, there a little, let's see. Let God explain it for himself. But in areas where we see some people being put up into some positions, the leadership positions, when the people that are put in positions are different than the ones God said you should put in there, we see how much of a disaster happens. So not saying women cannot be leaders and be CEOs and CFOs and leaders of companies and governors and mayors and doctors and all kind of stuff like that. So, but God said that women should not be proficient in the office of a priest. This is how he had specifics about how we shouldn't give sacrifices of the lamb, of lambs that are spotted and blemished or offerings of animals and things that are damaged or crooked or crippled. Because the sacrifice was supposed, to, was supposed to point to the spotless Lamb of God. The holy spotless Lamb of God. You remember when Jesus, remember when Jesus came to Mary? When she was crying and crying, when she saw the tomb was empty and she's like, oh. she's like, oh, please cry. Oh. And somebody voice came to her, Mary. And she said, huh? Mary. He said, why are you crying? Somebody took my master's body. If it's you and you've taken him, can you tell me where it is? I'll go find him and put him back. He said, Mary. Mary. Huh? And she recognized him. Rabboni. Oh, she's going to touch him. He said, Mary, no, touch me not. Why not touch him? He's like, oh, get off me, you pagan. Is he saying that? No, he's not saying that. Why is he said, touch me not? He said, touch me not. Let him finish speaking. Touch me not. For I'm not yet ascended, for I'm not yet ascended to my father and your father. Right? Because there's something very special and peculiar about the garment and about him. He loves Mary. He came back to see and to, and to talk with everyone, brothers and sisters. But he, he came and still spoke to her in human form, garbing and covering his, his beautiful power. But he said, don't touch me yet. Because sin, just the earth itself is defiled with sin. Even though she's a saving, loving, sin, loving sinner, she's not loving to sin, but she's a sinner. Like all, any one of us are sinners. But he said, touch me not. Because I, have not yet, for, because I have not yet ascended to my father and your father. So he said, your father too? That means he's a sister now. But he didn't make them his mother or put a woman over him. He's saying, I'm one of you. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That's what he means. So when, so when, so when he said, touch me not, he's saying, I need to be untouched by human hands and stuff right now. And he could have more deeper meanings than that. I don't want to take anything for that. But I said, he's very peculiar about how he does the ceremonies in the sanctuary service, as well as how he does the other officiating Offices he does. Even now, while officiating for us in the high priest and the God in heaven, he's doing his work. There's a reason why he has to do that. But he came back and spoke to them after and talked to them and ate with them. So this God who wants to be with us. He doesn't want to be apart from us, like, get away from me, humans, dirty, filthy humans. No. He's like, I love you guys. Come. Even when he had the sanctuary service, he put his he put the sanctuary in the middle of the tents and had the had the had the different tribes basically. Organized in a way that was actually around all the corners, of the, all the corners, with the sanctuary being in the middle. He was always in the middle. That's God. Like Medisa's song. Medisa's song says, He is the way. He was always God. He was all but God. He is. So, we, there's a reason why God says that. It's very interesting. We're going to continue. So, I'm going back and forth because I want you to say it's very in purpose. So God with us. He says here, So, His divinity was veiled with humanity, the invisible glory in the visible, in, in the visible human form. This great purpose had been shadowed for, sorry, had been shadowed forth in types and symbols. The burning bush in which Christ appeared to Moses revealed God. The symbol chosen for the representation of the, of the deity was a, was a lowly shrub that, seemed, that seemingly had no attractions. This enshrined the infinite. The, they're talking about this, in the sanctuary service, what those, those emblems, the, the candlesticks, the different things, the different the altar, all the stuff, all those different officiating issues, because this is of the New Testament we're reading from, right? Jesus came in the New Testament in terms of, after, in story of, um, of Matthew, going through the Gospels. But he was here from the beginning of, of the world of creation. Remember who talked to Abraham when he, when Sarah, before he told Sarah she was going to have a child? Who, who was the one traveling to a Sodom and Gomorrah? That was Jesus. The one wrestling with Jacob? That was Jesus. So I'm telling you, who won, who won, let us go on, let, let us go, go forward and make man in our image. Let us go down and make man in our image. That was Jesus in there. Who won Tal Babel? Let's go down and see what they're up to. That was Jesus. So it's not like he's new to the earth. This is his. He's been here all the time. Okay, but he's covering it. Okay? This great purpose had been shadowed, had been shadowed forth in types and symbols. Like the burning bush, right? This enshrined infinite. The all merciful God shrouded his glory in a most humble type that Moses could look upon it and live. So in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, God communicated with Israel, 
revealing to men his will and imparting to them his grace. God's glory was subdued and his majesty veiled that the weak vision of finite, finite, F-I-N-I-T-E, men might behold it. And men means women and men together and children, everybody. So Christ was to come in the body of our humiliation. So Christ was to come in the body of our humiliation. As said in Philippians 3 verse 21. In the likeness of men. That's how Jesus came. Born in a manger, in a stable with smelly animals. Hmm. Is that us? Hmm. Isn't that symbolic? Are we the animals in the manger? Hmm. In the eyes of the world, he possessed no beauty. That's Jesus. Well, hopefully that's the good wind and the rain coming. Can you see the wind? No, we cannot. As he told Nicodemus, we can't see the wind as you see the trees swaying and blowing, right? But you can see the effects of the wind on the trees. So could that be God blowing the thing and saying, hey, I'm here? Could that be? So I don't see the spirit. I don't see God. Do I have to see God to say, I know he's there myself? Or can I see the evidences of him? Did you just see the wind? I heard it. I see the trees still moving and swaying. But what if God said, I make man in our own image? So are we by chance seeing our own image and seeing everything of God? Now, I, ain't the, I ain't the most handsome specimen to look at. I'm here, 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 here. But I'm like, hey, I'm happy to be alive. Am I too dark? Am I too light? Am I too tall? Am I too young? Am I too short? Am I... Does it matter? I'm happy to be alive. God bless it. Okay, here God says. Okay. So in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, God communicated I'm tongue tied. God communicated with Israel, revealing to men his will and imparting to them his grace. God's glory was subdued, right? Let's continue the next one. So Christ was to come in the body of humiliation. Continue again, gone down down there. Right? In the likeness of men. So in the eyes of the world, he, God, possessed no beauty. Right? He's not the most handsome as you see some of the some of the videos you see of um, pictures of Jesus in some of the storybooks. Handsome, strong chap. Handsome looking one, long flowy hair, long thing, thing, thing. The Bible said he wasn't handsome. He wasn't pretty. But, well, but then again, what is handsome and pretty? Does it mean he wasn't embellished with makeup and all this stuff like the Egyptians, all these things in their eyes and stuff? He wasn't like, wearing like a six pack, a hundred pack? What was he like? I like, the, I like the depiction given to us in Revelation. Eyes of burning fire and hair like wool, flame in it. But he became like that. We'd be like, yo, 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 he's a god. We'd be like, scared. But it's not the same characters I see putting inside of some of the anime videos and stuff I see in the TV shows. Are we putting godly attributes and characteristics in a lot of the TV shows and, and videos we see around the world every time? Blockbusters. Making it about God, but keep trying to deny God. I'm often fighting against God. Pretending to be God. But I'm not God. Hmm. That's something. That's rich. Okay. So here's what God says. He says here. His glory was veiled. His greatness and majesty were hidden. And he, that he might draw near to sorrowful tempted men he's coming closer to us even though we're running from him always running from him god commanded moses for israel let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them is exodus 25 verse 8 and he abode in the sanctuary in the midst of his people through all their weary wandering in the desert the symbol of his presence was with them so christ set up his tabernacle in the midst of our human encampment and just as a manger i'm guessing too right he pitched, <laughs> I won't make a joke about that, but a donkey, right? He pitched his tent by the side of the tents of men, that he might dwell among us and make us familiar with his divine character and life. The word became flesh and tabernacle among us, and be, we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 verse 14. I read John 1, 1 in the first part, right? This is like a revised version. Since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials, right? And some sympathizes with our griefs. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our Creator is the friend of sinners. For in every doctrine, right? You see? For in every doctrine of grace, every promise of joy, every deed of love, every divine attraction presented in the Savior's life on earth, we see God with us. I want to tell you something. Go back to the story of, go back to the, the, the flood. Noah preached for over 120 years. 
many people that were on the flood that were lost in the flood I believe actually worked on the ark with Noah and his family to help to build it there are many people in our presence in our midst around us to come even from our bowels bowels meaning even from our seed our our what's the word I say our progeny our children our descendants you know people before us many of them you see may or may not enter the kingdom of God many people you see that you think Allah lost will be in the kingdom of God as God told us the scribes and the Pharisees the one who are trying to persecute and hate him and he'll kill the disciples many of them are going to heaven before them mean that they may not even enter but God God's people the, the ones cast away the ones who didn't know any better the ones who were tricked and maligned and mistreated and sold themselves out didn't know what they were doing God will forgive them and save them so as just as many as just as many of the people who were listening to the sermons and the words and the message from Noah was given to them and how to prepare the ark and to prepare them lives and get them ready for over a hundred and twenty years how long is this video how long is how long have you been watching listening to this video and these videos how long have you listened to sermons how long have you been going to church and are you just going to church are you not in church how long how long have you been how long have you been doing what you've been doing how long have you been living your life my life how long have you been living my life how long how long have you been going do what we do how long have we been doing what we normally do how long have we halted between many opinions how long how much time do we have because when the ark was finally inhabited there were only eight souls on board and then the door was shut for a week the animals went in seven by seven in the clean ones and the unclean ones went in two by two so the animals did get on board and some people did get on board if we as humanity at this point in time are almost in the number of almost nine billion nine billion people and we live only about as God said three score and ten about 70 years on average and the people before us lived much longer than that including dinosaurs and other other creatures big and giant and more, more small i mean bigger and more tall and strong and more intellectual say intellectual capacity than us well i think from how big they are and so close to the creation how many people do you think were actually on the earth before we came to our time that was we call it the antediluvian before the flood how many people how many people think were actually were actually in existence at that time and then well the question is how many of them got into the ark how many of them were saved? Of all those people on earth that could have possibly lived longer and stronger and smarter than us, that knew more, that did so much more than us, you mean tell me they only lived, the only, only eight people, only eight, only eight, only eight people got into the ark? How do you think Noah might have felt? Did I say Noah Moses before? I mean, I might have said, Mr. Spoke his name and I meant to say Noah. How do you think Noah might have felt? How do you think God might have felt? How do you feel? How would you feel if knowing that after all these Bible studies and readings and scripture and digital AI and phone, all this stuff is going on, that when time time when time when comes time for God to go and say, Okay, I'm calling your name now. Were they having a sleep early and an early death, unfortunately, or to judgment to happen? Or maybe God's come now in Armageddon. The apocalypse, the apocalypse. Suppose God, suppose our name wants to be called up here. Suppose this, the end of the end of the world is now. Suppose it's tomorrow. Everything happens so fast. It can't change fast. Nuclear? That could be that could be the last time we see. <laughs> last light is over. What would we say if knowing that after all we did, because of unconfessed sins or because of our own actions and bad decisions we made, or because of refusing to listen to God, we are then lost and then it'd be for naught. Is it, was it, was it, would it be God because of God's fault that we did not saved? Would it be because of God that because we didn't read enough of, this, of the Zab ages, that's why we lost? Would it be because of God? I mean, I think I started talk, talking in the other um, video. I didn't complete saying that. Even if you don't know the name of God or the word of God or even speak English and do all that stuff, God has written out his laws and words in our hearts and minds. So I believe that people will know the difference in right and wrong, regardless of what they see and learn from just hearing my voice or maybe you voice or another speaker, somebody else. God will talk to them in his own. He has a way of getting, getting, getting in touch with people. So I'm not worried about that regard. I think God will save. I believe God will save who he has to save. He wants to save us all. But again, if we choose to not follow his law, knowing that there is a law, then our blood will be upon our own heads. If we choose to study his law, knowing that there is a law, then we'll be saved. If we choose to, not, if we didn't, if we choose to do good, even though we never had a law in front of us, that'll be a, that'll be a law unto us to save us by, by, being, by being obedient to his word. If we choose to not do good, after not knowing, or just, just because not being aware of a scripture or Bible or words or books, 
and we choose to do wrong, we get lost. That's our fault. Just the same. So we can't say, well, because I don't have the proof, then it's, then it's such and such. No, it's a choice we made. So we reap what we sow. No going on with God. Let's read this. Let's continue with this one. Please, yeah. It's amazing. He said, so God wants to be with us, right? As he said, so the word became flesh and tabernacle with us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as, a, as, a, as the only begotten son of the father. Full of grace and truth. John 1, 14, right? Amazing. Let's see here. He says, since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials and, sympathize, and sympathizes with our griefs, right? People say, you don't understand how I feel. God does. He does. We're his children. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our creator is the friend of sinners. I'm saying it because I want you just to hear it again. For in every doctrine of grace, every promise of joy, every deed of love, every divine attraction presented in the Savior's life on earth, we see God with us. Satan represents God's law of love as a law of selfishness. Imagine that. He declares that it is impossible for us to obey its precepts. I mean, God's law. The fall of our first parents with all the hope, all the woe that has resulted, Satan charges, upon the Creator. He said it's his fault. Leading men to look upon God as the author of sin and suffering and death. Jesus was to unveil his deception. Now, now here's something. Some people, you tell them all this stuff, you give them videos, testimonials, texts, handshakes, sit down with them, Bible study, everything you tell, you tell them everything. And yet they still say, ah, I don't care, I don't believe, whatever. So I would say, we just have to present a message to them. God does the conviction. If they choose to refuse and, 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 and say, their, say their conscience against the word of God, that's upon them. Jesus was, here he says, it'd be sad to get all this stuff and then still be lost just because we choose not to take a chance to go and try this prison to follow what God's asking us I always tell people and myself like, what do I have to lose by trying to do it God's way he's not telling me to go harm anybody he's telling me just to be obedient to be kind and loving what do I have to lose he says here the fall of our first prince with all the woe that has resulted he charges Satan charges upon the creator leading men to look upon God as the author of sin and suffering and death everything goes bad in the world act of God Tornado, act of God. Death in the family, act of God. Storm, act of God. Destruction, act of God. But everything goes good. I did it. Everything goes nice. God bless. We did it. Give God his praise too. <laughs> Jesus was to unveil was to unveil this deception that what Satan was trying to do. Jesus was trying to rip it off and said that when he said he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, he's shown us what Satan is doing on this earth by living and showing the truth. So Satan accuses God of this. So he's called a great accuser. He accuses God of doing the worst thing and being selfish. And it's really Satan. Everything wrong that Satan is telling us that is, that is of God is actually Satan. He's giving us the opposite because he doesn't want us to know the truth. That's why he has sophistry and deception. He's a chameleon. As one of us, right, he, Jesus, was to give an example of obedience by showing us you can't do it by God. Even teaching the, the, the scribes and Pharisees in the temple. For this, Jesus took upon himself our nature and passed through our experiences. Came to the matrix, right? In all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Hebrews 2 verse 17. If we had to bear anything with Jesus, which Jesus did not endure, then upon this point, Satan would represent the power of God as insufficient for us. Therefore, Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are. Hebrews 4 15. So he knows. He endured every trial to which we are subject, and he exercised in his own behalf no power that is not freely offered to us. As a man, Jesus, he met temptation and overcame in the strength given him from God. He says, I am delighted to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalms 40 verse 8. And he speaks to his prophets. So many people say, oh, it's only David speaking. David speaking. If David is speaking, as I say, God is, all scripture is given for inspiration of God and, and men and, and women. God inspires them with his words and teaching and his spirits. So those words you hear are of God. If it's inspired. Not just anybody, regular, regular, regular comment, you know. No, you hear from God when it's inspired. Right? He says here, he says, I delight to do thy will, O God, my God. Yeah, thy law is within my heart. Psalms 40 verse 8. That's why I believe that everyone who even if they don't know the word of God in English and other things, they'll be able to speak God's law and be able to live by it. As he went about doing good, Jesus, and healing all who were afflicted by Satan, Jesus made plain to men the character of God's law and the nature of his servants, of his service. Jesus' life testifies that it is possible for us to also us also to obey the law of God. By his humanity, Christ touched humanity. By his divinity, Christ lays hold upon the throne of God. 
as the Son of, God, of, of Man, Jesus, gave us an example of obedience. As the Son of God, He gives us power to obey. It was Christ who from the bush on Mount Horeb spoke to Moses, saying, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. That's in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. This was a pledge of Israel's deliverance. So when he came to the, in the likeness of men, he declared himself the I am. The child, the ca capital child of Bethlehem, the meek and lowly Savior, is God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And to us, right, and to us, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the living bread. Not like those in Hollywood keep talking about I am God. They don't get themselves in trouble. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This is John chapter 10, verses 11, and chapter 6, verse 51, chapter 14, verse 6, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. You know? I am the assurance of every promise, Jesus says. I am. Be not afraid. God with us is the surety of our deliverance from sin. The assurance of our power, of our power to obey the law of God, of heaven. In stopping to take upon himself, or stooping, excuse me, in stooping to take upon himself, as S-T-O-O-P-I-N-G, to take upon himself humanity, Christ revealed a character, the opposite of the character of Satan. But Jesus stepped still lower in the path of humiliation. Being found in fashion as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. As the high priest laid aside his gorgeous pontifical robes, and officiated in the white linen dress of the common priest. So Christ took up, took up the form of a servant and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isaiah 53 verse 5. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which, we, which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. That is true. And like the disciples, they, they rejoiced that was able to suffer for him. By his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the, from the ruin wrought to sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring upon the eternal separation tied to bring upon all of us, right? To, was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than we had been never fallen. And if we had never fallen. In taking our nature, the Savior had bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, Jesus is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. And what? Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, right? He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave Jesus to the fallen race. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family, forever to retain his human nature. This is the pledge that God will fulfill his word. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son, and has carried the name, the same, into the high, highest heaven. It is the son of man who shares the throne of the universe. It is the son of man whose name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, the I Am is the days man between God and humanity laying his hand upon both. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separated from sinners is not ashamed to call us brethren. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 2, 11. In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together like the cross. It connects them. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. Of his people... God says, they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his hand. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 16 and 17. The exaltation of the redeemed will be an exaltation, an, sorry, an eternal testimony to God's mercy. In the ages to come, 
Jesus will show the exceeding riches of his, glory, of his grace in his kindness towards us, to Christ Jesus, to the intent that unto the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be made known. Oh, sorry. To the intent that, you know, all that should be made known. The manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purposes, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our, our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, and 3, verse 10 and 11. She writes, her, writes, her words are so powerful, and the words are so tiny, my poor eyes are <laughs> straining, but I, I believe you get the gist. Through Christ's redeeming work, the government of God stands justified. The omnipotent one is made known as the God of love. Satan's charges are refuted and his character unveiled. Rebellion can never again rise. Sin can never again enter the universe. Through eternal age, this will all happen at the end of time, when by everybody has finally seen and confessed, Lord, you are right. God has to end this whole sin thing. He has to end. Sin can never again enter the universe when God finally ends it. Shall I read it again? Through, our, sorry, through Christ's redeeming work, which will be salvation and saving us in Revelation, the government of God stands justified. What Christ did on earth already. The omnipotent one is made known as the God, as the God of love. Satan's charges are refuted and his character unveiled by seeing what, how God lived, how Jesus lived his life, even to be tempted of Satan, right, in the wilderness. Rebellion can never again arise in heaven, right, because they've seen what happens. Sin can never again enter the universe. Through the eternal ages, all are secure from apostasy. By love's self-sacrifice, the inhabitants of earth and heaven are bound to their creator in bonds of indissoluble, bonds of indissoluble union. I mean, we are, we are in us and God, God and us, we're going to be tied together. Threefold cord, you can't break that. The word of redemption will be complete. Sorry. The work of redemption will be complete in this earth and beyond. In the place where sin abounded, God's grace much more abounded and abounds. The earth itself, the very field that Satan claims as his, is to be not only ransomed but exalted. Our little world, under the curse of sin, the one dark blot in this glorious creation, will be honored above all other worlds in the universe of God. So take heart. This is going to end up nice in the end. Don't we go through a lot of stuff right now, you know? Here. Where the Son of God, capital Son of God, tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died. Here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And through endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift. God be praised. Emmanuel. God with us. Let us be partaker of this. Let us get ready to see this. God will do it. The chosen people, this is a nice one too. We're going to get to the other part. I can't read all in one setting. I'm going to take a little quick break, but I'm going to get back to the next part soon. Thank you so much. God bless you.